This will be the beginning of the antiderivative and integration chapter. So this section is called antiderivatives and indefinite integration. And let's start, first begin with all of the theorems and the definitions. So it says a function capital F is the antiderivative of little f on an interval i when the derivative of capital F equals little f for all x in the interval. So theorem 5.1 says if capital F is the antiderivative, so here you're going to be starting with the function little f, and then what you're going to want to find is you're going to want to find the function capital F such that when you take the derivative of it, you end up with the function you were given. Okay, so it says, and because you're finding what you would have had before you took the derivative, that's why it's called the antiderivative. So if f is an antiderivative of little f on an open interval i, then capital G is an antiderivative of f on interval i, if and only if g is of the form g equals capital F plus a constant. Um, so they're basically saying that if capital F is a antiderivative, so is capital G of the same little function f, okay, the same little f. The reason being is because no matter what this constant is, every time I take the derivative of this function, I'll end up with little f. And when I take the derivative of c, any c, any constant, I'll get zero. So you still end up with the same little f. And so that's what this theorem is saying, is that if capital F is an antiderivative, then um, capital G is also an antiderivative, where capital G just has a difference in a constant, okay? Capital G is what we call the general solution. So this is basically how all the solutions to little f, the all the antiderivatives of little f are expressed in this form. Um, and C is called the constant of integration. So the process of finding an antiderivative is called integration. And when you find the antiderivative, capital F, if you want to have the general solution, you always have to add the constant of integration. So you'll always be integrating to find capital F and then you'll always be putting a plus C to find the general solution, okay? The operation of finding all solutions is called anti-differentiation or finding the indefinite integration and is denoted by this symbol. So it looks like a long s and then the little f function and then this dx. dx is to tell you what you're integrating with respect to. So um, remember when we were taking derivatives, it was always the derivative of the function with respect to x. And you notice that in the denominator was always dx. Well here, it's not a denominator, it's just tagged on to the side, but that's to tell you what variable you're integrating with respect to. Now for the first, well, for calculus one, um, you're not going to be doing any other variables other than with respect to x. However, in calculus two, you do later eventually start integrating with respect to other variables. So this notation here does make a difference later. For now, you can kind of think of it as if this is opening the statement and this is closing the statement. You cannot have this statement without the ends, okay? So if you're talking about integration, you do have to have this S symbol, but if you have the S symbol, you also have to have the DX at the end, okay? You cannot write the problem like this. It doesn't make any sense, okay? It means integrate the function, but how? With respect to what variable, right? You have to have that notation there, okay? So the general solution is denoted by when you are given this integration, you find the capital F, the antiderivative, and then you add the constant of integration. Little f is called the integrand, so it's what you're going to integrate is called the integrand. dx is the variable of differentiation, so I'm, I'm taking the integral with respect to x. Capital F of x is the antiderivative of little f of x, and c, of course, is the constant of integration. So differentiation is the inverse of integration. So just to notate that, they're saying if you take the derivative of an antiderivative, they're gonna undo each other and you're just gonna end up with that little function in the inside. Or if you take the integral 
of a derivative, again, these are going to cancel each other out and you're just going to end up with the original function that was inside there. Okay, now here are some of the basic integration rules. So we've got the interval, the integral of zero dx is c. Why? Because the derivative of a constant is zero. The integral of um, any, any number, k okay, is a real number. So the integral of any real number is going to be that real number times x, and then of course plus your constant of integration. Why? Because the derivative of a constant times x is just the constant, and the derivative of, the, of this constant is zero. So that's why you don't see it here, okay? Now, the, this is like the reverse power rule, okay? So it's the power rule for integration. You had a power rule for differentiation, and now we also have a power rule for anti-differentiation. So before, what you would do is you would bring the number down as a coefficient, and then you would subtract one from the exponent. So here we're gonna do the opposite. We're gonna add one to the exponent, and then we're gonna divide by the new exponent. So everything in reverse. And then of course you always have your constant of integration after you integrate. So let's keep going because we have more um, integration rules. So the integral of a constant times some function of x, you can factor out that constant and just take the integral of f of x. If you have a sum or a difference of two different functions of x, you can integrate one term, plus or minus, integrate the second term. Um, if you have the integral of sine of x, it's negative cosine. The, derivative, the integral of cosine is sine. The integral of secant squared is tangent. The integral of secant tangent is secant. And of course, you always have these constants of integrations, um, so on and so forth. Here's some of those um, exponentials and logarithms. So if you take the integral of e to the x, it's e to the x, just like when you do the derivative, it's the same thing. If your base is not e, it's some other number, you still get that base raised to the x, but you also get 1 over ln of a, okay? And then the integral of 1 over x is ln of x, just like we did before when we took the derivative of ln of x and we got 1 over x. So they're just the reverse operations. Now, for rule number 5, I just want to point something out. Um, notice that when you have a plus or minus g, you're going to separate it and do the integral of f and do the integral of g. Well, when you do the integral of f, you're going to get a capital F, right? And you're going to get this constant of integration for this integral. When you do the integral of g, you're gonna get capital G, and then of course, it's constant of integration. And to note that these two might be different, I put C1 and C2 as subscripts. So you end up with this. You end up, if you distribute this plus or minus, because I don't know if that's a plus sign, I don't know if it's a minus sign. So I distributed the plus or minus to each term there, and then I separated it. So you end up with F plus or minus G, and you end up with C1 plus or minus C2. Well, here you end up with these two functions, plus or minus, depending on what you started with, right? But if you have C1 plus or minus C2, it really makes no difference what these numbers are. You're still going to end up with the constant, okay? So basically what, what that means is that when you're taking the integral of multiple terms, you don't need to have multiple constants. You just integrate each term according to the rules and put one big fat plus C at the very end. Okay, and that'll cover all the constants of integration within each term.